Welcome to A Growing Concern. I forget when it was, the 70s or the 80s, when we started hearing the term global village. At least that's when I first started hearing it. And uh, what it's all about is, you know, everything we do, or a lot of things that we do, affects the planet, even though it necessarily isn't a direct influence on what is going on on the planet. And tonight we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in a place called Borneo. And uh, I'm not really up on this, but that's good, because we've got two folks here that are going to talk about it. We have Joe Lamb on my right, and we have John Paisley on my uh, closer right here. John's been on the program before. I think he was actually talking about Borneo back then. That's right. And, and we're going we're gonna to dig a little bit deeper, drill down into that a little bit more. And we're also going to talk a little bit about a, uh, an event that's happening this Sunday. Uh, regarding the, uh, the, what is going on over there. I know like most places that indigenous people have been living for thousands of years, the, uh, the resource extraction companies are coming in and wanting to take the resources and push them out of the way, whether that's Borneo or, or places like when Edith Maranti was on here and in places in Africa and India and, and or South America. And, you know, people are getting pushed out of the way here when it comes to fracking and, and, uh, and uh, resource extraction uh, methods like that. So there's a lot to talk about, and we're going to try to bring it, bring it home to, to include the folks that are out there viewing because we all have... We all have have a part in that dynamic but uh, we'll move ahead right now and uh, we'll get into a video later and also some photographs but welcome to the program thank you very much lovely to be here all right it's good to have you both good Thanks to have lot, you again Jim. so it's great uh, to be back John set this up when we were uh, when I was uh, <clears throat> excuse me when we were uh, working on either show a month or so ago and uh, boy I just don't want to lead off I mean uh, why do people need to be concerned about Borneo it's a good place to lead off huh? well it was in the 80s when Joe first got familiar with the situation there. And uh, at the time, it was all surrounding logging. And uh, some people in Berkeley, let me know if I'm incorrect about this, Joe, but uh, found out about one individual from uh, an indigenous group in Borneo whose fruit trees had been bulldozed by a timber company, mm -hmm. and things took off from there. How did that go, Joe? Um, it, actually, there was a, a guy who worked for the New Yorker named Stan Sesser that wrote an article about Umabawang Kelawan, this village in Borneo that uh, became famous in the 80s because these logging companies went in and started ripping up their forest. They took bulldozers and went through Jock Jow's uh, ancestral fruit garden and all of the vi villagers instead of just rolling over went out and started blockading the logging roads mm -hmm. and they got arrested on mass they took like uh, a huge percentage of the village to jail for basically trying to protect their own land and that's uh, that, that particular incident got a lot of publicity in Europe, and it got very little play in the United States. Big surprise there. Huh? Uh, yeah, big surprise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and way back then, I got roped in uh, to the idea of forming a sister city. It sounds like an absolutely crazy idea. Uh, it's a beautifully crazy idea. Forming a sister city between Berkeley, California, and this community, uh, this longhouse wow, community in Borneo as a tactic for trying to give them some political cover. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's, that's how I got involved in it, and that was the beginning of the Borneo project some 23 years ago. Uh, but. And that's the same project that you came on and talked about a while back when you were, you were setting up to, to create electricity and all that's the different right. things that you did. That's right. I met Joe in the early 90s, probably 91 or so. I actually, a mutual friend of ours and I were together one day, and she said, I know this guy who just got back from Borneo. And I don't know why, but I just lit up, and I said, Borneo? Mm -hmm. Like, it's the most exotic place, you know, mm -hmm. in my imagination. And uh, she said a few things about it, and I, I grabbed the phone, and I said, call him up. So we called Joe, <laughs> and I talked to him for about five minutes. And the last thing I said to him was, next time you go to Borneo, I'm going with you. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, in 1995, we went together with a group of 10 people and conducted a community mapping workshop at the village of Jok Jow, the guy who he originally met, mm -hmm. whose fruit garden had been bulldozed. And that sort of snowballed into all the work we've been doing for the last mm -hmm. 20 years. When that land got bulldozed, I mean, did they had did they had deeds to that land or any of that, or that's just their ancestral land, and that's how they were able to bulldoze it? 
<coughs> That's a really, really, really great question and a kind of complicated question. But, but the simple answer is that, that you, the simple answer is you shouldn't be ashamed for not knowing anything about Borneo because I knew nothing about mm. Borneo until I got involved <laughs> in this project. And since I've been involved in this project for, for a couple of decades, I constantly encounter people who know almost nothing about Borneo. It's kind of off of everybody's radar. But, but Borneo was an island that was basically ruled as the private sultanate of this, uh, the heirs of this British adventurer who was given title to the island by the Sultan of Brunei way back in the 1800s. He cut a deal with the Sultan of Brunei that if he stopped the headhunting, he could, uh, this guy James Brooks, uh, that he could have the island as basically his own private sultanate. Uh, and he stopped the headhunting and he then ruled over the island as a quasi-benevolent despot, as did his children up until World War II when the Japanese invaded. After World War II, Borneo got divvied up uh, between Malaysia and, and Indonesia, Indonesia. And, and Brunei. Uh, mm. And uh, the, uh, during that time, th there were constitutions that were drawn up that did grant land rights to indigenous peoples, but it didn't demarcate which lands were their lands. So it said technically that the native people have rights to lands, but it didn't say exactly mm -hmm. where those lands were. Mm -hmm. So, so that's part of what we were doing when we were there was teaching native people how to make their own maps so that they could then go out and say, okay, this is our ancestral land. This is where our people have lived for hundreds of years. Uh, this is the land we're claiming under the Malaysian constitution because we work mainly in Malaysian Borneo is part of our lands. So the more complicated answer, mm. I mean, the more direct answer to that is they did have rights to their lands, and they oftentimes didn't have title to their lands. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to help them secure uh, title uh, to their lands. Sure. Now, what uh, you, you mentioned uh, timber companies. I would imagine a lot of the, the timber is gone by now, and what is left is there's probably still fighting over it. Were those international timber companies, or were they United States? or The timber companies that really took over were actually originated in Sarawak, in Borneo, generally owned by um, Chinese, ethnic Chinese, mostly from Fujian province in China. And uh, they grew very, very wealthy, very fast. Um, the situation in 1995 when we sh were, were there to do the mapping workshop was, well, what really illustrated it for Joe and I was we went up country to the, up along the ridge near the, near the border of Indonesia and we walked for three days through virgin rainforest to, uh, to get to this spot where we were wow. gonna go and see the river and fish. And one year later, when I went back, that whole tract of land was gone. So that, that's just one illustration of how fast that country mm. was logged. And at that's this all point, hardwoods too. It's many, many kinds mm -hmm. of wood from hard to soft. It's, one of, it's the most diverse rainforest in the world. In, one, one, in, a, in a radius of one mile in a typical tract of Borneo rainforest, there could be 1,200 different varieties of trees. And that's not to mention the biodiversity of the insects and all the animals. Exactly, there as medicinal well. plants. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, and all this is the livelihood of these people who we work with who live in that forest. So when, when, when most people think of livelihood, they think of something they're going to turn, turn around and sell. But that livelihood in this case probably means they, they live directly with that. A sustainable yeah. life yeah. in yeah. the forest, with the forest. And that's why it's so important for those people to be able to stay on their land. Mm -hmm. They really have no life anywhere else. You know, and then you mentioned, uh, I, I think about uh, South America or places where they, they cut the forest down, but then they plant soy or something. But they're not doing anything like that. They're just devastating the land, and it gets a lot of rain probably, and it, it just erodes away. Well, that's perfect. That's a perfect point, too, because what happens is they will selectively log a tract over a course of five years or so, go in there five, six times, first take the very best, biggest trees, then go back in, take a little mm -hmm. more. At that point, generally what's happening now is they go in, they clear cut the whole area, they terrace the land, and they plant oil palm. 
Oil palm is oh, the biggest export for Malaysia right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's exactly what they want to do with all of Sarawak right now. And it's, that's proceeding at an amazing pace also. That's, it's, it's, that is the crop that is, that is uh, putting the, uh, the uh, let's see, the, uh, the orangutans yeah. at risk, yeah. right? The it may not be there, but it's, 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 is, it, is it there as well? It is there. Is no, it there? no, that's where the orangutans are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we have someone on talking yeah. about that. Yeah. And I, ran across, I run across that now and then, that, that, the, uh, that, that they are very much at, uh, at risk. But, you know, they're warm and cuddly in some ways, but there's a lot of other animals that yeah. maybe aren't being told about. Is, is, is there anything else, any other biodiversity species that are important? That uh, not that they all aren't important, but I mean that are, that stand out more. Uh, that's a uh, that's also a very good question. Uh, uh, yeah, there are clouded leopards. Uh, the the Sumat the the Bornean rhino, rhino is uh, it pro probably extinct now. There are pygmy elephants in Borneo that are threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, the biodiversity there is just uh, astounding. I mean, it's one of David Attenborough's favorite uh, places because of, you know, the flying snakes and the flying oh, frogs and just, uh, oh. you know, stuff that you've, that's like right out of Avatar, except it's real. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, and they're not and, blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're not blue. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. the only difference. Yeah. But, but, but to place the logging in its context, you know, you were, you were mentioning South America. I have been working in Borneo uh, for roughly 10 years, before I ran across this statistic by Lisa Curran, who's a professor now at Stanford, uh, uh, who documents that more logs came out of Borneo in the 80s and the 90s than out of all of South America and all of Africa combined. That, that the logging that was taking place in Borneo was taking place at just an astronomical scale that, that's really uh, unimaginable. Yeah, th there were very powerful corrupt forces driving the speed at which that logging was taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, log, the people that were given logging concessions by the government would have to pay large bribes in order to get the concessions, and the concessions then were only good for one year. So after they'd paid this huge amount of money up front in order to be able to log it, they had to get their, they had to recoup their, uh, as quick their as profits yeah. quickly because they only had a year in, to, in which mm. to do the logging. And then the same corrupt government officials would then re-license re mm. them the next year. And it was, uh, uh, it was economics, you know, creating this uh, amazing disaster that the former prime minister of, of Great Britain, uh, Gordon Brown said was the single largest environmental crime of our era. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was a astronomical in scope, really. Well, it's not really logging, you know, what we call it that. It's strip mining. Yeah, that's, that's You know, that's basically exact, what they're doing. Right. They're just stripping the land and, and, and it's leaving it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it does rain a lot there, and it's probably mountainous, so there's a, must, a lot of erosion, which leads me to the point that you can't be talking about the land without talking about the water. Right. Yeah. And so I know Save the River and all the... Uh, was some of the uh, the graphics that we had up? We might move into that. Is is that part of? Uh, since the, the logging has been so intense, you are now focusing on on the rivers. Well, if the logging wasn't bad enough, the latest plan mm -hmm. of the the Sarawakian and the federal Malaysian government is for a project which they call the Sarawak Corridor of Renewable Energy. Unfortunately, uh -oh. the word renewable yeah, is not sound applicable good. at all. Mm -hmm. They want to build 12 mega dams, dam every major river in the country, and try to produce thousands of megawatts of electricity, of which there is no need for in the state of Sarawak. There's not a whole lot of population in that. No, no, they've already got more electricity they can deal with just with the three dams that have been built already. They're going to attract some of the most dirty, um, polluting, non-green industries in the world, steel plants, glass manufacturing, aluminum, aluminum mm -hmm. yeah, to, tr to uh, create this industrial corridor and create toxic reservoirs in all the rivers and make it impossible for the indigenous people to live on their land because they'll be underwater. 
I get I get visual visions of some of these uh, movies we've seen about you know the, the future where you know everybody's living underground and there's just nothing but smoke and a haze over <laughs> everything and uh, they're deliberately doing that. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of money in it. And the Joe mentioned the corruption. The family-owned businesses, all tightly connected with the government of Sarawak, control electricity contractors, road building, uh, concrete manufacturing. Mm -hmm. They make money coming and going. It doesn't matter whether the dam makes money after it's built at all. They've already made millions and millions of dollars just building the dam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that sounds like, you, I'm not sure we want to continue with this. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. But you have a video that, that has something to do with the rivers, it, isn't it? it? It'd be a great idea to, to cue the video, and then, and then we could talk about uh, actually the very positive future that is possible, because I don't want this to all sound like it's just do gloom and doom, because there, oh, no. th there, is a, there is a very positive future that we'd love to uh, also talk about after, uh, after, after, we, the, so after we take a look at the video. So this is what, six minutes? Uh, it's actually 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes, yeah. okay. All right. Oh, you can relax. <laughs> Doing all right? Doing fine. The rivers of Borneo flow through the oldest rainforest on Earth, with sustaining the forest activism. and the lives of hundreds of thousands of indigenous peoples. But now, a development scheme to construct 14 mega dams is accelerating climate change, driving species extinction, and critically altering indigenous communities. For millennia, the forest has provided everything they need. Abundant food, medicine from forest plants, and wood for boats and houses. The people of Barum named the mountains and the rivers after their ancestors who built the first longhouses here. They have a deep and intimate relationship with the land that has sustained their traditions and their livelihoods for many generations. We are here in the Barum, surrounded by the beautiful rainforest. We are floating on this beautiful Barum River and we can have the best fish you can ever find. As part of Sarawak's development plan, known as SCORE, the Bakun Dam was completed in 2010. An estimated 10,000 people were relocated from the flooded areas. If you were to go to the Bakun area today, you would smell a foul stench, and it's the smell of sulfur uh, uh, being emitted from the reservoir. The trees are deforested, and simply the vegetation is burning away uh, because you have such an influx of uh, nutrients that that water quality in the Bakun reservoir is like acid. <laughs> Some of the greatest impacts of displacement include extreme hardships for women and children. Now, a 1,200-megawatt dam is slated for construction here on the Barham River. If this Barham Dam is to be built, it will flood an area of 412 square kilometers. And this will flood more than 26 longhouses along the Barham and its tributaries, the Kayans, the Kenyas, and the Penans. And it will displace more than 20,000 people. 
sedang ambil lepas mayuk mudip ke tanah ambil pe taruh ambil sutuk ala ge yeti ambil makin teruk keluar matai batuk mek mong i don't think we can ever understand what it's like to be pulled by separate forces you know and you don't want to move anywhere else that's where you want to be if the dam is to be built our homeland our long houses our burial ground our places of interest all will be under the water this will definitely put an end to our livelihood our culture and custom we want the government to respect our boundary to respect our right upon our land The forests of Borneo host more tree species than anywhere else on earth. Of the 15,000 plant species on the island, nearly 5,000 are only found here. We have seen the widespread destruction of the forest in Sarawak and the extent of this is about 70% of the whole of Sarawak has already been logged. Borneo is home to many endangered animals. A lot of the species that are found in Borneo are not found anywhere else in the world. By the year 2030, Sarawak will become a developed state. So if that target is going to be achieved, the world is going to lose all this uh, wildlife that is found only in Borneo, including the orangutans, including the uh, bird that Sarawak is named after the hornbill, it's all going to Perish. Electricity from tropical mega dams is not green energy. Vegetation decomposes at the bottom of the reservoir and that produces methane. The, the carbon budget of these reservoirs over 10 years is likely to produce as much uh, CO2 equivalent in methane as a typical fossil fuel power plant. And of course they are going to make money but the money is not going to go to all the communities living in the, the dam areas. The money is going to go to all these big tycoons. We will do whatever means, whatever ways, we will oppose the Baram Dam, even if it costs our life. They treat us like animal. That's why I fight, fight for it. We fight for it. Philip Zhao has taken leadership for his people as a member of the organization Save rivers. Right now, I'm standing at the side of the proposed Baram Dam. So, we uh, demand the government, the state of South, especially, to remove all these materials because we, the people of Baram, totally reject the Baram Dam. We want to preserve our river, we want to preserve our forest, we want to preserve our land. In a society that, that's less open, it breaks new ground, it opens space to, to step up in that way. I'm the chairman of Self Rivers. The majority of people who are affected by the dams do not agree with the dam. And even today, there are more than 300 people outside this hall who are against the dam, they cannot join this conference. Save our forest! Our forest. Don't destroy our home! Don't destroy our home! Don't flood our home! Don't flood our home! Don't kill us! Don't kill us! Don't kill us! Don't kill us! We want them to meet these demands. Then Sarawak Energy and the Sarawak government stop all work on mega dams in Sarawak. Your voice has been heard to some extent. You must assure us that no more mega dam project in Sarawak. I can't assure you, sir. I yes. can't assure you that. Hey, yo, hey, yo. Hey, no, hey, yo, Stop 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 Save Rivers held their own conference called the Alternative Conference. You have inspired us to be with you on this journey until there is no Baram Dam. Kita akan 
mendirikan satu pekerjaan yang baru yang menghormati adat kita. Ini yang penting. I would say that the solution for us in Borneo is an organized, empowered civil society. So there certainly are energy alternatives, solutions that could uh, end energy poverty on the island of Borneo. Examples would include micro-hydropower plants um, at the level of, of uh, communities, um, solar, wind, uh, even energy efficiency gains are there for the island of Borneo. The people of Borneo are bravely developing an alternative future one that enhances the rights of indigenous peoples and preserves the forest for future generations. You can help develop that future. Our salvation is in each other. Whether this dam is in the United States of America or this dam is in Borneo, it's equally devastating to us. If it's done in, in that shared spirit, I think it's powerful. People across the world can support the Save Rivers Coalition. Support the Borneo project here in the United States. Write a letter to uh, the board of Sarawak Energy. Uh, publish uh, an opinion piece in your local newspaper. And simply pass on the word. Uh, tweet, post things on Facebook, social media. The power of people on, on uh, the internet now is simply too great for corporations to bear. And so the more that we uh, uh, educate the world and the more that we talk about this issue the the more the change is likely to happen visit borneoproject.org and find out how you can get involved today All right, welcome back. I'm going to resist the impulse to watch that again because it was that good and uh, there was just so much there. They're, they're a wonderful, beautiful people and the land is incredible. And uh, they're, they're, it is being, what is being done to that land has already been done to this country in, in a lot of ways. It's just that we're a lot bigger country and they we're not as isolated like that. So we, we have seen what is going on here, but still. Resource extraction has uh, changed the face of this country, and it's on the way to be changing the face of this, of this uh, uh, large island. I, I was asking how big it is. You said it's the size of Texas. The size of Texas. The third largest in the, uh, the, in the world, third, the island. Th third largest in the world. And if you want to see the film again, you can come to our event. Oh, no, we Sunday. haven't even talked Sunday. about that. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> All right. So I thought it was a good point. To uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad because I'm, sometimes I totally forget what I come on the air for. Yeah, but but, but uh, we are having an event Sunday. I think we got a graphic about that, so you might talk a little bit about it. The event is Sunday at Mississippi Pizza. I think the address is 3542 North Mississippi, from 1 to 4 p.m. We're gonna kick it off with a little talk by Joe and uh, show the film again. And after that, we've been lucky enough to have a whole great collection of craft work by the people who are most affected by these dams and the resource mm -hmm. extraction there. Is that an exhibit or for sale? We're going to sell them. All right. Yeah. yeah. Good uh, deals. Good place to get a Christmas present. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Not nice one you're going to get anywhere else. Not when shopping you know. extravaganza for mm -hmm. anybody who's interested. Yeah. You take credit cards? We do. Oh, um, right. You can make. You need to ask you, that you these days. You can make your purchase online mm -hmm. because all the money goes to the Borneo Project mm -hmm. and then straight to Save Rivers in Sarawak. All right. And so uh, you know, just to, cause just come see that video again will be worth it. And you're going to be you're going to be playing that video and then giving a talk, and then you know you probably will give a, maybe a little bit of talk about the different uh, things that are on exhibit there as well. Sure. I would think because. Sure. Uh, and just discuss with you know anybody that wants to just talk about these uh, mm -hmm. talk about these issues. There's a lot sure. of interesting ins and outs on them. But mm -hmm. so we've uh, shot through about over half an hour. You know, you brought some pictures, and we got those on on a, on a disc there that it can be played. Anything you want to get into before that, or you can just kind of do that as we cycle through. Well, th the pictures are uh, uh, I images of the of the Penan people, uh, which is one of the tribes in Borneo, one of the groups in Borneo. By the river here. Uh, uh, y yeah, they're some of the last uh, nomadic hunter gatherers in the in the world. Although they've been recently forcibly. Uh, 
settled by, by the government. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, nomadic peoples, just like with Native Americans, you know, the people that have the widest range of property uh, are the ones that the government wants to try to contain uh, mm -hmm. the most because the land is, has value. Uh, so the pictures that you're seeing now are, are, are pictures, uh, contemporaneous pictures of, of the Penan people, uh, this uh, beautiful, uh, really lovely, uh, people who have lived in Borneo for tens of thousands of years. Uh, unlike the other uh, indigenous peoples of Borneo, the Penan never engaged in headhunting. Uh, they've always been sort of reclusive uh, uh, nomadic forest dwellers. Um, John had the good fortune of spending some time with the Penan. But I've spent a lot of time with a lot of groups of Penan and uh, the things that I've learned about them are that when you first meet them, you think they're they're a very shy people. You know, they kind of stay out of the limelight. They're just sizing you the up. Forest. <laughs> but they're actually very proud. You know, mm -hmm. we uh, mm -hmm. back when we first um, were working in the 90s there, um, we heard that uh, the rattan that they use to make these crafts, that if you come to the event, you'll see the beautiful baskets and mat that these Penan people can make. Um, the rattan that they used to make those was becoming very scarce because of the logging and very hard to find, very hard to get. To get. Like women would come up to me and say, our husbands used to go out, you know, we used to go out like the back of our house and collect mm -hmm. enough for, a, for a, a big mat in a half a day. Now our husbands have to leave for three days to do this. and. Uh, and so we started um, a project of uh, making a nursery to, to grow, like nursery grow rattan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't really successful. And we didn't, we, we didn't really know why until I finally got into some very in-depth conversations with some Penan. And uh, wow. they, weren't, they weren't really interested in taking care of the nursery because being a farmer and growing things is actually not the same as as being a hunter gatherer mm -hmm. and they feel like it's it's it, it's not the skills that they were made for <laughs> sure. so they can't uh, get interested in it so they're they're very proud of their way of life and mm -hmm. they really want to keep it the way it always has been um, you know, that's, I've, that's I've, just one aspect of I've their noticed, personality. I've noticed some of these pictures, like there was that one kind of just a, a shack with just some uprights with something over the top. Now, that's not their typical housing, isn't that's it? Their that's, that's their house. That's their house. It's their wide ancestral, open like that. That's, that's their ancestral form of living. So, they were semi-nomadic. Yeah, there would, we go. They would make a settlement like this wow. and live in it for six months or so while they harvested. There's a particular palm that is called sago that they can get a flower from, a starch, that was their staple food. So they would harvest the sago in one area, and when, when, it, when they got it down to the point where they'd gotten everything out where it could still regenerate itself, they'd move. They'd move they'd on. Just, yeah, mm -hmm. dismantle mm -hmm. their houses and leave and travel for 30, 40, 50 miles and set up in another mm -hmm. location. That, that was their life. Kind of the equivalent of a teepee, you might Basically, say. Basically, yeah, sure. And so obviously it must be pretty warm there then. Uh, it's it's equatorial. Warm. Yeah, heat yeah. isn't a problem. And you notice they had fires right on the, uh, you know. I was going to say, yeah, mention it, that. They had right on the platform. Yeah, right, right on the platform. That's a good trick. Yeah. The, 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 you know, <laughs> we in the industrialized world uh, tend to think of pe traditional people as not really having their own science or their, uh, and, it's just and, a different and, science. and these guys, you're right, exactly right. You know, that's our ethnocentricity. Uh, w one of our, one of our close friends is an anthropologist who's worked with the Penan for 25 years or so. And, and he went to this one place in the forest with a Penan elder where he laid out a big track and the Penan elder identified every single plant in, in it. Mm -hmm. And I, I have, done graduate work in plant biology and I know that there's nobody uh, from major universities who could go and do that, have that same depth of knowledge about the plants that are there. I mean really mm -hmm. that guy has much more than a PhD's equivalent uh, of knowledge about, sure. about what those plants are and what they can do uh, and their importance. 
And, and unfortunately, I mean, as you know, globally, that, that we're losing that knowledge. We're losing the language. We're losing the sure. the, the, the the elders are not teaching it to their kids, and the you know the place where they I mean the forest that they live in is also vanishing. So sure. That, well, the kids that, don't want, don't want to learn it either. So, so so what's happening now is is that. The, th this next series of photos is about how the Penan have and other groups there have responded to the logging, and since the since the late 80s and in some senses even oh, earlier than that, they started blockading logging roads. The, 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 this gives you a sense of scale. About uh, uh, th those are that's a timber plantation on I was just land. Just going to say yeah. to just this massive amount of land that's been mm. cleared. They, they, so they are replanting. Then. Ah, uh, yeah, but they're replanting acacia for monoculture uh, pulp. Uh, yeah, it's uh, all meant to be harvested. And, and, and eucalyptus, and, maybe. And, and this gives you, yeah, eucalyptus in some yeah. places. And, and this map, which is uh, was made by the World Wildlife Fund, shows you the disintegration of the forest from the 1950s. Uh, uh, through now and what's projected into the future. And, and when you look at that, you have to realize that Borneo uh, it was, many people consider it to be the world's oldest rainforest because it has been continually covered uh, by forest for an astounding 130 million years. And, and, and to place that in its context, you know, primates didn't evolve until 60 million years ago. Mm -hmm. so, so Borneo has this odd geologic luck of never having been glaciated, uh, you know, it wasn't destroyed by any of the major events that happened in the past, and it had this forest that remained intact up until 1950. And then uh, now, this is, uh, this is a shot I think that I took uh, on the way to the Bakun Dam of land that had been recently been just these vast, vast tracts of land that had been cleared uh, for oil palm plantations, for palm oil plantations. And how long will them plantations last? Probably not that long. The, the, the plantations, I think that they last for 20 or 30 years. And then uh, the soil's gone. Then. Well, well, the soil could actually regenerate it, if it's done correctly. Uh, it, it, there's a guy a, a couple of years ago that won the, uh, won the Goldman Award uh, who was taking down palm oil plantations in, I think, Thailand uh, and allowing the forest to come back in. If you do it correctly, uh, it is possible to get the forest back. So, so, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask what this was. Sure. So, so th this is the the site where the where they are testing to put up the next dam, the Barham oh, Dam, checking the soil and the yeah, yeah Doing checking the, the geotechnical soil. work, yeah. things and, like that. And so we kind of went in there and uh, we're we're checking out the area uh, with with the native uh, with the Save Rivers uh, Coalition there, and, and the Barham River is something that means something very special to to John and I because our sister city is on the Barham River, and, and it's a place that we have this deep emotional uh, connection to. Uh, that, that's the uh, shot down the Barham. That, that forest right in there actually, is, some of it is primary forest, and some of it is, you know, some of really has very important biological diversity uh, as well as cultural diversity that's in it. But you want to speak a little bit about your affection for the Barham River? Or, or uh, the um, I many of my friends, having been there off and on for the last twenty years, um, live in this area that'll be flooded out. Um, there's a there's a village called Long San, um, which will be two hundred feet underwater if uh, if mm. this dam is built and the reservoir is flooded, and. Uh, those people, which you've gotten a little bit of an idea from the film, are uh, their backs are up against the wall. Um, this is a lifestyle that they've been involved in, you know, for probably ten thousand years, you know, and uh, for At them least. to be facing the end of it is, uh, I mean, in one generation, even exactly, you know. So, so, so this this shot right here is a shot that I took at the Penan blockade around the Murum Dam. The, the Murum Dam is one of the dams that has actually been completed, but, the, but they, hadn't complete, they hadn't filled it up with water yet. 
And, and the Penan from many of the villages that were around there started blockading the road that was going uh, to the Murram Dam to try to uh, prevent further uh, construction on it. Uh, and uh, this is this makeshift city that they that they built right on the roadside to just live in to, to protest the uh, uh, existence of the of the dam and it's you know it's really rough uh, situation to live right on the side of this blasted out road uh, where they where yeah. they stayed for uh, uh, for several months and when we went in there we were followed in th there were a couple of checkpoints. Where the, where the police were trying to pre prevent people from going in there. And we just sort of blew past the last checkpoint and the police followed us up to the, to the spot here. And then they didn't uh, actually harass us. I think there's a shot later uh, in this. Uh, uh, yeah, that's another shot of, the, of their little tent city along the side of the road. But, but the police were lined up on both sides of the blockade, you know, with you know, assault rifles, just sort of watching us uh, the whole time. And it, it was very instructive to me because later on when we left and went back out, we, we ran into the, the lawyer who's representing the, uh, these Penan from Murum. And he was trying to get into the same area uh, to investigate the fact that their village had been attacked by arsonists, probably from the companies that were building mm -hmm. the dam. And they prevented him from actually going in there, uh, which to me was a very odd situation that, you know, in some senses I think it was kind of white privilege that they didn't want to get the publicity of like harassing these white boys going in there. But yet the lawyer for the people, they actually prevented him mm. from, from going to the, to the dam site itself to try to get information about the arson event, which would, after the village is flooded, no longer be available. But um, uh, this is just a, a sort of a more hopeful uh, picture of some, some Penan kids. I didn't want to uh, leave everything being very uh, depressing. But, but actually, the, uh, the shot, if you could roll it back a couple of, uh, a couple of frames, the, the, this place right here is one of the relocation centers where they're going to move villagers to from throughout the Barham area uh, when, the, when the dam is constructed. So, so imagine if you were living uh, here in Portland and suddenly your home was being flooded and they were moving you into this like Stalin-esque uh, apartment complex mm. that's actually built in the middle of, a, of an oil palm plantation. I was thinking gulag. Uh, yeah, yeah, gulag. <laughs> yeah. gulag. With other people who you've never met before in your life who are being moved into the same, uh, from disparate villages, suddenly into the same spot. Uh, imagine how, how disorienting and how, uh, just what that would do to your culture if, right. you were, mm -hmm. if you were suddenly plucked out of here and, you know, put down in the panhandle of Oklahoma uh, in some land that was very different from any land that you'd ever been in before. Well, it's, you know, a small degree, you know, it, it happened in the Hurricane Katrina where yeah. folks were stuck in trailers and stuck yeah. in gymnasiums yeah. for months. Yeah. And uh, it, didn't, it didn't threaten their culture, but it sure threatened their, their, uh, their, their, their yeah. lifestyle. Right. Not to mention the fact that these people need land to survive and there isn't any, there isn't nearly enough land for these mm -hmm. families to raise the food. I mean, they're used sure. to raising food to actually survive and there's no access to that kind of land for them. It, uh, it just reminiscent of what happened in this country, the Native Americans, it's the exact same thing. I mean, it, it, it is. it's the exact same development and unfolding you know, whether it's in this country or in, 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 in any number of countries, South America, uh, Africa, whatever, I guess that's, that's the end of the pictures there. Yeah. Well, with 14 minutes left, and you know, uh, it's kind of cliche, but when you get through something like this, you know, what can we do? I mean, what is going on? And um, obviously you've got organizations. We've got a bunch of different websites. I don't know if they were actually put up on graphics yet, where people can follow up and learn more about this. Yeah. But uh, there are things people can do. Yeah. Yeah. One of the main things they can do is is to sign up with the Borneo Project, a and we don't. We're working in coalition with other organizations, working increasingly in co coalition with other organizations in Europe, 
and in Borneo to try to figure out something that we can do together uh, to, to really try to bring, uh, stop this. And it may be petitioning the United Nations to send human rights people to investigate what's going on there. Uh, we're thinking about uh, the, the investments for these dams, 80% of the mm -hmm. money that's going to be spent uh, on these dams will come from private investments. We're trying to figure out where that's coming from and trying to figure out a way of getting the information to those investors to let them know that, that, that tropical hydropower is not green energy and that, that's, that there are huge human rights costs to these dams. Uh, so the main thing is to, to just uh, sign up with us so that so that you're available, so that people are available when we do try to mobilize lots of signatures to mm -hmm. to political officials saying, please contact the United Nations so that the United Nations can send a special rapporteur for indigenous rights to Malaysia to investigate these. That, that's one thing that can right. be done. These types of projects can only exist when they are in the darkness of ignorance of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. and so the only thing we can, the most effective thing we can do is shine the light of understanding and get as many people, like Joe said, Borneo is not really on the radar for so many people on mm -hmm. this planet. And our job is to get it on people's radar for people to understand it and spread the word. And mm -hmm. that the light of people knowing what's going on there will eventually spread to power centers that might have a chance of stopping it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what created the environmental movement. As you know, you may think it hasn't been very effective, but there is an environmental movement in this country, and it has done some good. And then that 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 can be moved over to there. We have the Borneo project. I know there was a couple other. Uh, website you mentioned, Save the River? Save Rivers is the local coalition of indigenous people who is on the ground helping these people to blockade the dam site. They're the ones who are making all that possible, going around to all the villages that will be affected and educating them about what will happen, the flood that will happen, mm -hmm. and getting them to understand their situation, mobilize the mm -hmm. community to That's be the against one there. it. Right. So, I mean, this is an ongoing project, the Baram blockade, passed its one-year anniversary about three weeks ago, and uh, they've had people manning it constantly. You know, they need to be fed. All this is the work of Save Rivers to keep this going. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's a, so it's a so, blog spot then. So that's really the main channel to where the money for this particular event is mm -hmm. going. And I, I, unfortunately, I, I, it all takes money, but it also takes passion. I, I, right. th I think if, uh, if uh, viewers just uh, also Googled Save Rivers Borneo, I think there's a saverivers.com or .org website in addition. Actually, if they go to the Borneo Project website, th there'll be a there'll link. There'll be they'll, links. They'll, yeah, they'll take them back to the Save Rivers. There are a couple links They'll take them back to Save Rivers. I think they have a Facebook page now, too. But uh, another really important thing that people can be doing, Jim, is exactly what you're doing. You're connecting the dots between indigenous rights struggles in, in Malaysia to indigenous rights struggles in the United States to the indigenous rights struggles in Canada. That There are roughly 300 and 40 million indigenous people on the planet, and they're all facing very similar things right mm -hmm. now, where there's resource extraction, mm -hmm. whether it's the Adivasi people in India, who are having this amazing struggle with Tata Steel, uh, trying to uh, you know, expropriate all of their land, to what's happening in, in, in Ecuador with, with, uh, and Peru with uh, the oil companies, uh, mm -hmm. with Chevron and the other oil companies in there. Nigeria. In Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is happening, in an escalating rate around the planet, and it, I was having a conversation with Mark Plotkin, the guy that the guy that wrote *The Shaman's Apprentice*, who's done a lot of work in the Amazon. And I was saying, you know, in my opinion, like native indigenous rights are going to be uh, either we're going to either secure native rights in the next 10 to 20 years, or there's going to just be you know a huge massive loss of land rights for native peoples. And he was saying, no, you're wrong. It's the next five. And, and, I, and I think that that's sort of true, that there's mm -hmm. this giant, uh, increasingly large land grab that's taking place on native lands all around the planet. And, and if native peoples are not recognized as being fully human, as having the same rights as everybody else, uh, uh, there's, 
it's, it's uh, well, I don't want to be apocalyptic or anything, but but it, it, it's this hard is not the, to. The, I mean. This is the this is the time uh, mm -hmm. uh, for us to really act in that regard, in my opinion. And, and oddly enough, the key to uh, we soon discovered when we were working in Borneo. I went there originally thinking about saving the forest, and very soon it became apparent that that's not the issue. That the issue is that the people and the, the forest are one. Uh, conjoined thing. And there's been a great deal of science recently showing that that's the case. Uh, uh, Eleanor Olstrom, the first woman to ever win the Nobel Prize in economics, that was her work showing that that people who live on the land actually take much better care of the land than do distant landlords. She was saying that the tragedy of the commons, which was a, which was a common uh, system of thought ab about the environment back in the 60s and 70s is really misapplied when we look at native peoples. That it's not the people who are living on the land who are harming the land. Uh, those people actually, if you do scientific studies about it, are the people who are taking much better care of it. That it's the, what she calls the roving bandits, who are the distant landlords who come in and don't have to pay the consequences of pillaging the land, mm -hmm. but reap all of the profits from it. And that's uh, what's happening globally, uh, you know, at an increasingly... You know, whether uh, they're going at, in there after the meat or the rhino tusks or, you yeah. know, the monkey meat or to sell in the bazaars. There's just so many different things going on in these places. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one thing that could be done, it's be, I think it's being done in some countries in South America, they've created a, a we got bill of, human bill of rights, but they're creating a, a nature bill of rights. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh that would take care of it, but it just you don't you don't hear about that much. I don't know if there's any talk of that going on in, in Borneo or anything like that, but I think that that Mother Nature, you know, was we're an extension of that, and so it would seem to me that if Mother Nature was given the rights that uh, that uh, she has, because without Mother Nature we wouldn't be here. Right. Yeah. And apparently they don't want to conduct themselves as if yeah. we depend upon Mother Nature. And yeah. it's these people who live on the land, truly have a real tangible connection to the land, who would be able to, under, to explain to us all how mm -hmm. that would work. Because mm -hmm. they're the only ones who really understand mm -hmm. what it means. Yeah, that's the intangible sure. value that we all need yeah. to really survive the crisis that we're all facing right now of how to keep our keep our whole species alive on this planet. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, the part that was missing from what you were talking about, we could throw a hoop out there and, and, and the indigenous people could tell you all those different plants, but they could also tell you how they all interconnected. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And, and you know, yeah. that, that is the issue, it would seem yeah. to me, how not just those plants, but how they, the bugs and the trees and the, the climate and all of it, all fits to, it's one unit. And whether yeah. it's that way or it's globally, uh, that, that is something that is not factored in. And, and I think that, uh, and, rights for human nature for nature would would uh yeah would make people more aware of that because they're not yeah 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 i think you're right that's exactly that's right it. so what we got we got five minutes left it might be a good time to go back into the uh the event that's coming up so folks can come in and learn you know learn more about you got a lot of eloquence here regarding this issue you both and and you probably only unfolded a small part of it here on the show and there's something going on Sunday where the people can find out more about this. Well, that's right. We'll, we'll do the presentation and show the film again and sell some crafts. You'll get a chance to, to get your hands on the products of these people's expertise, which is really quite amazing. But also, we'll have a conversation for three hours on Sunday afternoon, and people will have an opportunity to learn about this, which is really mm -hmm. what it's going to take. The, the event will actually be introduced by my daughter, who's 12 years old. Her name's Carson Lamb. She was born on Earth Day, thus the name Carson. She was named after Rachel Carson. Rachel, right. But I took her upriver in Borneo when she was not quite two years old, and, and which seems like another crazy idea, almost <laughs> as crazy as a sister city. Uh, but it was also a, a, an idea that worked beautifully. It was, it was wonderful. The, the way that she opened the hearts of the people around her and the way that she just immediately blended into the space uh, was, was really remarkable. Um, we, after this one drunken party, uh, th they love to, to celebrate at the Longhouse. And it, I have these very fond memories that like three in 
the morning after dancing all night, <laughs> drinking Borac, trying to hide to go to sleep, and, and some 75-year-old woman who are tattooed from her knuckles all the way up to her shoulder, <laughs> grabbing me and dragging me Pulling back out back to out the longhouse floor. floor to make me dance for another hour or two. My gosh. But, but, but in Stamina. The, in the, <laughs> actually, the high point of the trip that, that Carson and we all went to the longhouse was uh, watching Joe get remarried in the in the local style and wearing his loincloth. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank God I forgot those photos. <laughs> oh, I'm really I'm lucky that, that I did. Well, you'll be showing on Sunday, right? <laughs> that, yeah. But, but, but when I was there with Carson, we were, uh, we went, I went up to the reforestation place, and there she was, you know, like not quite two years old, and I'm carrying her up this really slick hill, and I'm standing among all these trees that are, you know, 12 inches in diameter, and it was the place where they had started the reforestation from work that we had done like 10 years earlier. Right. And, and there, if we're working with a team at UC Berkeley that, that's doing this in-depth study uh, in the area, showing that economically, if you develop Sarawak's rainforests by keeping the forest intact and by, by having distributed electricity that's generated from solar and from micro hydro mm -hmm. and from biogasification, and you're protecting the species diversity and you're, you, you're you're rewarding the area for it being this amazing carbon sink that it generates much more wealth over time than do these mega dams and this other development. Mm -hmm. So even on just hardcore economic reasons, uh, it makes so much more sense uh, for the forest to be left intact and then very carefully uh, tended in such a way that it, that it will release it's huge wealth for all of us over time. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the hopeful part, is that there is, that, that there are a lot of people there who really understand that, who know that, and who are working uh, very hard to make that possible. And, and that's the other alternative that we have to keep talking about. It's not just destruction. There is this other alternative future that's there, that's very real, and that these people uh, have a lot to teach us about. Mm -hmm. that. We're down to about a minute and a half. He, he gave a pretty good final summation of his feelings about it all. You have another 34 seconds. Well, I just seconds. want to remind everybody <laughs> that the event, all once right. again, is on Sunday at Mississippi Pizza, 3542 North Mississippi, from 1 to 4. Come down. It's a perfect opportunity to do some holiday shopping, buy some beautiful baskets, and become a part of this effort, you know, to really create something wonderful in the oldest rainforest on the planet. Mm -hmm. And I've often said in the past that, you know, the reason why the resource extraction and corporations can get away with that is because we don't conduct ourselves like a community. And we need to conduct ourselves like yeah. a planetary community, a global village, and support what's, what's uh, the positive things that are going on in these places. Because yeah. it, without that, uh, the whole place is going to look a little spot of green this big, and the rest of it's going to be the at the island and, and, and it's going to end up looking like this country with three percent of our native forest remaining. Well I guess we're down to 20 seconds. I want to make a special point to thank the crew. Uh, it was uh, touch and go there getting everything done in time tonight and I, I really appreciate them going the extra mile and uh, we'll be back next week for the last show of the year so uh, hopefully you'll tune in next week.